or, or, or use of the data. I'm sorry, uh, say that again because my Zoom was talking to me while, while you said it, so. My question is, since I'm the chairman, should I start at exactly at all, all minutes or I can start a little bit later? But since already there is, is a recording, it's my pleasure to announce uh, the next talk of the seminar. This is by Sergio Lopez um, Permut. The title, the first part of the title, Basic Extension Modules, uh, and the second part is written um, um, in the presentation. All bases are created equal, but some of are some are more equal than others. Please, Sergio. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It is an honor and a pleasure to participate in this uh, nice, uh, long-standing, ongoing seminar. Uh, I double-checked with Ivan uh, uh, when I accepted the invitation. I, I said, well, I hope, I hope non-associative means not necessarily associative. Just like in non-commutative rings, we, we, we mean not necessarily commutative. We don't usually mind a commutative talk if that's where things land. So, uh, so here, uh, I have done very little non-associative stuff myself, but I think uh, the potential for doing this in a non-associative uh, context is there. I, I do not see why one wouldn't do that. In fact, I spent um, some time about a, a month ago fiddling with the possibility of doing something like this with quandals. And, uh, and the reason why we were looking at quandals was uh, because my collaborator at the time, the, the person I was visiting with uh, was, um, uh, he is uh, Ilham Dadi who is uh, an expert on, on quantum. So for me, it was an opportunity to learn and to uh, maybe extend these ideas in a new direction. But let me let me go ahead and, and get started with the talk. Um, the, uh, the title, as you know, is... Uh, is uh, an attempt to to bring back uh, a quote from the literature. Uh, this is from Animal Farm by George Orwell. And it's interesting how time goes because you, when you think you're being the, the cool professor that has all these very nice quotes and references, uh, your students scratch their heads because they don't know what you're talking about. And that can happen with with a literary uh, quote like this, but sometimes it's even worse, you know. I was thinking the other day I was extremely cool in, in my calculus class because I was quoting something about the Simpsons, and it turns out that the Simpsons themselves are now quite an old show, and so some of the kids just thought about it like, oh yeah, that's something my parents would watch. <laughs> it's not what I watch on TV anymore. So it's very hard to stay cool, but I uh, I keep on trying. Um, there is some truth to the um, to the uh, the subtitle, and uh, it's something that keeps popping in my mind every time I'm working. You say, well, this the 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 motto for this uh, investigation could really be that bases are not as equal as we are accustomed to thinking about them as being. Uh, I mean, when you were taking your linear algebra class, you would normally, if you wanted to do that, you would say, well, let's pick a basis, any basis, and then you would keep on doing. And picking the basis just allowed you to think of vectors in a more concrete fashion in terms of their coordinates. But which basis you picked really didn't matter. That's what I mean by all bases are created equal. Now, usually the linear algebra class uh, that we teach, at least in American universities, uh, um, 
is um, on finite dimensional vector spaces. And uh, things tend to work the same way in infinite dimensional vector spaces, but there are some subtle differences. And that is where my talk is, is, uh, is uh, um, set. So suppose I have a vector space V over a field F, let's say that it has an infinite dimension, and suppose I pick a basis B for V over F. Then V is going to be isomorphic as a vector space to the direct sum of copies of F indexed by B. And the isomorphism uh, is given by V maps to the direct the, the, the sum of uh, of uh, a linear combination of the elements of the basis and this is just my notation for the corresponding coefficient okay so it's a little bit going in circles but uh, the coefficient for for w uh, for v is v brackets sub w that's the coefficient of w when v is written with respect to b okay so this is this is an isomorphism and this is what uh, uh, the punchline in your linear algebra class is yeah we know that vectors don't have to be n tuples but you can think about them as being n tuples in many different ways so uh, the support of v is the the number of non-zero coefficients in that representation and by definition, that set of, of uh, coefficients for which the, the coefficient is non-zero must be finite. Otherwise, the sum doesn't make sense. So now, in the infinite dimensional case, and this is where being infinite uh, is interesting in my story, uh, the, uh, the set f to the parenthesis b is properly contained in f to the b without parentheses. f to the parentheses b tells me that I can think of this instead of the concrete representation as a sum, I can just hold on to, to the coefficients. And so this is gonna be like an infinite uh, uh, sequence, but all but finitely many elements will be zero. And then on the other hand, in F to the B, there are no restrictions. These are just, uh, this is what we call the direct product. And uh, I am not asking that only finitely many be non-zero. So, um, the elements of F to the B without parentheses may also be written as sums although we have to take that with a grain of salt. These are formal sums. Uh, they are infinite linear combinations, if you want to call them that, but we know not to take that too seriously uh, because you cannot add infinitely many things. Uh, there is no assumption here of any uh, topology or any convergence. And so we know that this is just a symbol, but nonetheless, it is a good symbol. It does represent our elements. So as I said, no sense of convergence is assumed. Uh, uh, if infinitely many of the coefficients are non-zero, this is still uh, a valid element of F to the B without parentheses, but it's definitely not an element of F to the B with parentheses. Now, this collection F to the B is also a vector space. So using Sorn's lemma, we know that this collection also has a basis of its own, okay? And this is something that we uh, are usually willing to accept because we, uh, most of us tend to accept the, the axiom of choice. And so we just, just live with that. Uh, but something that is a fact is that, that such basis now is a bit out of reach uh, it's a it's a bit bit complicated, um, you know. If if we were looking at uh, at polynomials versus power series, 
we know that the collection of power series has a basis, but uh, I I have actually never never seen a concrete one. It's just something that we that we believe, and therefore it's not extremely useful. It is useful when you are saying, uh, yes, it has a basis, blah blah blah. But if you're trying to do some calculations, it's it's not extremely useful. So on the other hand, we can think of uh, of uh, B as being a pseudo basis uh, for F to the B. F to the B without parentheses. Okay, and I just wanted to remind myself to say I have never seen anybody call this a pseudo basis. So I am introducing that expression here, and I'm doing that with a little bit of caution because I, I'm not ready to talk about it too much, but I put this little copyright thing here, not that I'm really not allowing you all to use it, but I, I just wanted to say this is, as far as I know, the first time that that this expression is, is being used. I, or maybe there's a similar notion somewhere and I'm just not aware of it. But, uh, you know, B does behave a lot like a basis for F to the B. For example, every sequence of elements determines uniquely an element of, uh, here I said B, I needed to say F to the B, right? That's what bases are for. And uh, and algebraically, the behavior of these representations is also quite good. If I take uh, infinite sets of coefficients, infinite sets of coefficients, uh, when I add these two, like one adds sequences, that is uh, the the one that represents the sum of the elements. So the pseudo basis uh, does reflect the the structure, in other words, adding here is the same thing as adding the coefficients. And likewise, multiplication by a scalar behaves the same way. I multiply this element times alpha, it's the same thing as multiplying each coefficient times alpha. So this basis B, uh, or this pseudo basis B, has uh, some significance for F to the B, and that might be helpful considering that a basis to, for F to the B is not readily available. So this pseudo basis maybe has something that it can tell us. And that's what, what we are after. The quality of B as a pseudo basis, once again, my copyright joke, uh, for F to the B can be checked by comparing its other properties with those of B as a basis for F to the parentheses B. Okay, how how well does this pseudo basis uh, work uh, doing other things? We we saw my, my my list of of three things that it does do. What else can it do? So, um, for instance, representations of elements of V with respect to B and C, two different bases. Um, you know, that representation, normally we take the identity transformation and we represent it with respect to the bases B and C. And the whole purpose of having that so-called change of basis matrix is that uh, you can take a representation of V with respect to the basis B, which is now just a, a, it's just a vector. You can multiply it with this matrix and that gives you the representation with respect to the other basis. And so, um, so this is the formula we teach in our linear algebra courses. So, we would like to maybe do the same thing for F to the B without parentheses. See, we can have our change of basis matrix. We know that it is the inverse of these other change of basis matrix. Uh, they are column finite matrices because 
the way we construct them is we take the elements of bases B, for example, and we put their coordinates as columns. And these are elements of F to the parentheses C, so they're finite linear combinations. So these matrices are, are row finite. They are invertible, they equal each other. Uh, and then if we were trying to look at the representation of an element of F to the B without parentheses, uh, representation or the element itself, it's the same thing. We would maybe like to multiply this matrix times V and create a representation of V with respect to C. But then we run into problems. Uh, it's difficult to guarantee that this product will make sense because this is an infinite column. And so when I'm multiplying the rows times columns, uh, these rows could potentially be infinite. Remember, it's only the columns that we know are finite. So an infinite vector uh, dot product, an infinite vector, it might yield an infinite sum, and that's when things break down. And so we try to bypass this difficulty if we require this to be not to be row finite, not only column finite, but also row finite. Okay, that's the essential ingredient in the stew that I am cooking for you today. In this case, when I have this property, I have been using the expression that B is congenial to C. Okay, and I tend to abbreviate that with that little arrow. Okay, so this is a connection between bases of an infinite dimensional vector space. The basis B is congenial to the basis C if the translation matrix is row finite. Right? It is row and column finite, but the column finite is for free. It is an invertible column finite matrix whose inverse is also column finite, which is not something that can be uh, taken for granted, but here it's part of the definition. So um, as we study this, it is possible that, that we have that the matrix itself is row and column finite, but the inverse fails to be row finite. It will not fail to be column finite because they represent linear transformations. So that's automatic, but it could be that you lose the row finiteness in the uh, when you take the inverse. In that case, we say that B is properly congenial to C. Okay, in my mind, and you will see why this is the case. Uh, this is like a, like a partial order. And so B is bigger than C, but bigger than or equal than C, but C is not bigger than or equal than B, then that means that B is strictly bigger than C. So that's where the expression properly congenial comes from. And this is possible. It does happen in nature. It's also possible that they will be congenial in both direction. And for that, we use the expression that they are mutually congenial. And it's also, of course, possible that, that they don't relate at all, that B is not congenial to C. In other words, this matrix has infinite rows, and the inverse also has infinite rows. Okay, and in that case, we say that they are discordant. Okay, so these are my, my, my element. Notice that, and this is once again going back to your linear algebra, if I take bases B and C and a matrix, which is a unit in, col in, the, in the set of column finite matrices, okay? So I need, I need it to be a unit there. That means that the inverse is also column finite, okay? Because it's a unit in column finite. Then given two of these guys, the third one is determined. You only need two of them and the third one comes automatically via this equation. 
In other words, you can start with the basis B and choose the matrix P, and you can find uh, a basis C that does that. Or you can fix C and B, and then you can find this matrix this way. Or you can fix C and P and find these bases this way. Okay. So in other words, what we're saying is that the group of units in the family of column finite matrices acts, this is a group and it acts on, on the basis of V. And this is really a left action. I should put my P here. And you can think then that the, the, the matrix is acting on the basis and creating another basis, okay, via this equation. And this is a group action and it is transitive uh, precisely because of, of this idea that any two um, determine the third. So this is um, an action. But um, in general, now that we have that little bit extra uh, tonality with our congeniality idea, if I fix any basis and I take a matrix uh, P, which is row finite, but its inverse is not row finite, then I can find a basis that goes here. Or using the same matrix or any other one like it, I can find a basis that goes here. On the other hand, if I have a basis that is row finite and so is its inverse, then I'm going to produce a neighbor to the right. Or if I take bases that, that neither them nor their inverses are row finite, then I can create these neighbors to the left. And, um, and yeah, this is the way it looks. I, I often use the expression fractal when I refer to this because see which bases you put in the center doesn't really matter. Uh, what tells you the kind of neighbors that you're getting is the choice of, of the basis of the uh, matrix that you're using to create those neighbors. So this picture repeats again and again and again, you know, this, this guy here uh, uh, is going to have neighbors to the left and neighbors to the right, neighbors above and below in the same fashion. So you have all of these things. It doesn't matter who the guy is in the center. And that all goes back to all bases are created equal, even in this setting. Okay. But... Um, something that that I should mention right here, and you know, when when we started this investigation, congeniality was an ancillary uh, subject. We were studying something else, which we call amenability, and uh, and then a question popped up, and we needed to introduce congeniality to help along the discussion. And so people, or even ourselves and uh, my audiences, many times feel that congeniality is an ingredient of the amenability study. And I always say, no, 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 this is only about vector spaces, but it's hard to, to change that perception. And that's why in this talk today, I decided to, to not mention amenability. So far, I had not done that yet. I have not officially done it. I have not really told you what that is, that word means, but uh, but to say one of our interesting results here is that if B is um, congenial to C, then um, I can find a map from F to the B onto F to the or F to the C. This is C. Okay, uh, see, being congenial means that this makes sense. Okay, and this is guaranteed to be onto. 
And that's a little bit of a surprising uh, fact. And it might not look so surprising to you. So like I would do in my calculus class, you know, in calculus classes these days, you don't prove theorems. But uh, sometimes if you have at least this temptation to say, well, look, you might think this is trivial, but the trivial way to argue doesn't work. So I'm going to show you a wrong proof. Actually, I will show you two wrong proofs. Okay. And this is my tip of the hat to non-associativity, since you guys kindly invited me to a non-associative seminar. The problem here is the lack of associativity. See, you can say, suppose I have my, my, my matrix P. And suppose it is row and column finite. Okay, so, but suppose it is such that its inverse is not row and column finite. So what we really mean here, and this is another notation that we tend to use is we say, this is an element of not row, but, but yes, column finite. Okay, so I have this situation and uh, trying to prove that the, that the map is onto, that multiplication that this matrix is onto, you will say, well, pick an arbitrary element of your range, which should be F to the C, and, uh, and set the equation multiplying times P, multiplying X on the left times P is trying to give me V. And I would like to uh, to solve this equation. So one possibility is to say, well, P is invertible. So let's just multiply on the left times P inverse on both sides of the equation. So I multiply P inverse times PX equals P inverse times V. You're doing the same thing on both sides of the equation. And, and here there are uh, two difficulties. One of the difficulties is that this multiplication, once again, I'm running into problems because the matrix is not row finite. So does this multiplication really make sense? But the non-associative ingredient of why this is the wrong proof uh, comes here when you say, well, I would like this to be X. I know that P inverse times P is the identity but can I associate? And multiplication of infinite matrices can fail to be associative. So, so that is um, that is uh, one of the reasons why this, this is not the right approach. I'm not gonna show you the right proof. I'm just gonna show you the wrong proofs, okay? If you were my calculus students, I can already see it. End of the semester evaluations. The teacher only shows us wrong proofs. Second wrong proof. Okay. I just think it's really cute because you can say, well, you know what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take PX equals V and then you start doing row operations so that you can start finding who X is, right? You do row operations, you start getting an infinite, uh, uh, Gauss elimination kind of thing. And from there you can solve. But conceptually, this is what happens when you're doing row operations, you're multiplying on the left times uh, invertible matrices. But because P is an infinite matrix, then, um, then this is an infinite product. Okay, and you're multiplying on the left. And, uh, and then eventually, you know, you could maybe transform this into just uh, X, but there you're gonna be trying to, to perform this idea again. X is P inverse times the, the inverse of this product. Now the inverse of this product, uh, you would think it's the product of the inverses written backwards. Okay, now this is an infinite product going to the left. Now this is an infinite product going to the right because you're writing it backwards. Uh, 
And when you're trying to perform this product P inverse times, times this guy, uh, this will work very well as a, as a right inverse. See here, when I said this guy, is this really true? Is this product really the inverse of this? And it works okay on the right. See here, you can start multiplying R1 cancels with R1 inverse, R2 cancels with R2 inverse, and so on. And so in the end, you maybe get the identity. But if you're trying to multiply on the other side, here you have to go from R1 to infinity, and then somehow start from infinity and go down. And so you are not sure where this is ending and where the next one is beginning. And so is this even defined? Okay. So this would be incorrect approaches. The proof can be done. Uh, it is in one of our papers. Uh, there is one version of the proof where we do give it a little bit of a topological flavor uh, because uh, uh, convergence is inherent there, but you have to use the, the box topology and uh, product topologies, stuff like that. And uh, I don't want to, to bore you with the details. Okay. So, but now the real point of my story. Remember that the real title of the talk is basic module extensions. So we're going to need algebras now. So what if V, the vector space that I started with, uh, is now a, an F algebra? Let's, let's rename it now. It's A because it's an algebra. Uh, so ju just like before, you know, F to the parenthesis B is isomorphic to A, but now there is more to this guy. He inherits the A algebra structure. A is a regular algebra over itself. Therefore, F to the B is also an A algebra. And this is inherited by, by the, uh, the bijection. So um, the natural question is, can I extend this A algebra uh, structure to inherit the, I hear I shouldn't have said A algebra, maybe I should have said A module structure. Two F to the B, okay. And uh, well, one natural way to achieve this would be if we require uh, multiplication times an algebra element or an element here could be given by the matrix that represents things. Represent left multiplication by R, which is an, a linear map represented with respect to the basis B, which is the basis I'm using to create things and perform this product. Okay, and if you can do that, then this is extending the structure from F to the B to F to the B, okay? But there is one catch and it's a familiar catch. We have seen it before in this talk. What if this product doesn't make sense? And so in order to have it make sense, we say, well, let's ask for for every R in A, this guy is row and column finite. Once again, column finite is a freebie. We are requiring for this guy to be row finite. And um, well, this doesn't always happen. It sometimes happens, but sometimes it doesn't. So we have to name it, and that's when amenable comes in, okay? Amenable is, well, someone who's willing to help. So this uh, basis is willing to help. All of these representations are row finite, and therefore the, the module structure can be extended, okay? There is no connection between our use of 
amenable with other uses of amenable in the literature. It was a little bit of ignorance on my part that I wanted a new word that had not been used. I felt that this reflected the spirit, uh, but it's it doesn't have anything to do with amenable groups or or stuff of, of that kind. Okay. So let's look at an example. Let's go to the algebra of polynomials with a single variable, okay? The standard basis that consists of monomials, monic mon monomials, this one is amenable, okay? When I multiply um, uh, the elements of this basis times any polynomial, that's gonna be rho finite, okay? But on the other hand, this basis C, consisting of 1, 1 plus x, 1 plus x plus x squared, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and so on, longer and longer sums are nicknamed for this basis with my collaborators is telescope. Somehow, you know, you think of the telescopes that you can stretch. Uh, so this telescope basis is not amenable. Okay, for the record, B is properly congenial to C. This B is properly congenial to that C. That's not what we're talking about right now. We're discussing the amenability, but I thought I would present it here since I have not shown many examples during this talk. So why is this not amenable? And here my notation is gonna be a little bit of a mix match, but I don't want to spend too much time being pedantic. So a typical element of the product, once again, let's think of it as a sequence right now. So you could have one, 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 dot, 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 one, 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 one. They're all ones, okay? Uh, as a sum, we will think this is one plus one plus x plus one plus x plus x squared and so on. But right now I'm just looking at the coefficients. And let's see, can we multiply this times x? Okay, I'm trying to multiply it times uh, every element of the algebra. So in particular, can I multiply it times x? And multiplying times the matrix really means multiply it the way you normally would, do the multiplication, uh, and then represent this in terms of, of the basis C. And if I do it that way, then multiplying x times this sum Remember, that's what this coefficient means. I'm adding all of the elements of the basis. Then I distribute. So this is x. This is x plus x squared. This is x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. And you could say, oh, you could do it. There's no problem with that. But remember that a valid answer has to be an infinite linear combination of elements of C. This is not given here as a linear combination of elements of C, these guys. And so I start rewriting. And instead of writing X, I write one plus X minus one. Instead of writing X plus X squared, I write one plus X plus X squared minus one. Instead of writing this guy, I write this guy, which is an element of C minus one. And every one of the terms that appears here is going to be actually one of the terms of the basis minus one. And so when I try to simplify this, I can't because there's an infinite number of minus ones which I cannot add together. And that is the reason why this basis is amenable, but this basis is not, okay? This basis allows me to create a module this basis does not. So when B is amenable, then F to the B does indeed have an A module structure. And, uh, and so mission accomplished, that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to create these uh, modules. Uh, the final goal is to study module theoretic properties of these new modules. But um, can this always be done? If I give you 
some algebra of infinite dimension, do I know that it has an amenable basis? The answer is unknown in general. But in the case when the basis is countable, then the answer is yes. We always have an amenable basis. Okay, so here uh, it's an open problem. Uh, we have not been able to find a counterexample, but the proof that we know, which is based on a Pace Nielsen paper on infinite matrices and their conjugates, um, it doesn't doesn't apply in the uncountable case. Another possible question: Is it possible? Is it possible to have the extreme opposite? Have an algebra where all bases are amenable? Well, not really. If A has amenable bases, then it also has one that is not amenable. Okay, this was actually a fun uh, way in which we got this result. I was attending uh, one of those uh, SIMPA courses in Jamaica. Uh, they, they had a nice group of young people. This is several years ago. And one of them uh, who ended up going to, to Uruguay to pursue his PhD, but at the time he was, uh, he was not even in the PhD program yet. He, he came up with a proof for this. He told me, no, 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 this, uh, you cannot be always amenable. If you have one that is amenable, you also have, have one that is not. So his name is Jose Armando Vivero, talented young man. I think he's in Europe right now, but he's from Cuba, PhD from Uruguay. Uh, another good question at this stage, suppose I have B and C which are amenable. That means these guys are mod modules. Do they have to be isomorphic? I mean, they are built in such similar ways, the same construction both times, just different, uh, different ingredients. The answer is not necessarily, okay? They do not have to be isomorphic. We spent a lot of time writing papers about this topic without really knowing the answer to this question. Um, we had a little distraction that they made us feel like we understood, but right now we we have finally settled uh, examples where the modules are not isomorphic. Uh, we know examples, they appear in that paper I was referring to, where the bases are discordant and the modules are uh, not isomorphic. We know examples where one basis is properly congenial to the other and the modules are not isomorphic. And that brings us back to where congeniality originally appeared. If both bases are if they are mutually congenial, then one of them being amenable is equivalent to the other one being amenable, and the modules that are created are isomorphic. Okay, the isomorphism would be, well, the, the mutual congeniality map multiplication by the uh, basis translation matrix. Okay, that's where uh, uh, amenability was, I'm sorry, congeniality was born to give us a necessary condition for uh, basic modules, these basic extension modules to be isomorphic. Uh, and in fact, if I had B properly congenial to C, then uh, actually the amenability of one is independent from the amenability of the other. Mm -hmm. You can have this one is amenable, but this one is not. Or you can have this one is amenable, but that one is not. But if they are both amenable, when they are both amenable, then this map is guaranteed to be an epimorphism, uh, just like we discussed in general, that congeniality maps are always onto. And uh, in this case, when they're both amenable, it will be a linear. And so this is an epimorphism. Okay, so that justifies what I was saying before that I think of uh, 
the basis B as being bigger than the basis C because the module F to the B that it's creating is bigger than the module F to the C. And uh, when we started fiddling with stuff and this, this idea came to mind, what if I had a basis B where every time B is congenial to C, uh, C cannot be amenable. But you know, C can be amenable if the congeniality is, is mutual. And so trying to say nobody below B is amenable. B is amenable, but nobody below B is amenable. One way to express it is if B congenial to C and C amenable, then C has to also be congenial to B. So C is not properly below to B. Okay, or another way of saying it is if B is properly congenial to C, then C is not amenable. If that can happen for some basis B, we would say that the basis is simple. There is a, a, another concept of a projective basis, and it would be one where it is amenable, but nothing above it can be amenable. Conceptually, the, the, the notion is there, but we have never seen an example. We've never been able to find an algebra uh, that has a, a projective basis. On the other hand, finding simple basis was, no pun intended, was simple. We took this very down-to-earth algebra of polynomials, and we took the first basis that pops in mind when you're thinking of the algebra of polynomials, and it turns out that this guy is simple. Okay? Now, this is... Um, uh, a disservice when I don't show you the proof because the proof is really neat in my opinion. It's one of those proofs that one feels very proud of uh, because if you think about it, this is uh, uh, quite a complicated situation. You have your basis B and now you have to somehow allude to all other bases and you have to, to see uh, that if this is amenable, then you're going to be able to reverse this arrow. Okay, so so it is it is a nice uh, proof. At this point, it is the archetype of any proofs of simplicity. We kind of go back to that pattern and say, well, can we mimic this? Can we make it work? And uh, speaking about that. Do always, do all algebras have simple bases? No, there are algebras that do have them. There are algebras that do not. Are simple bases unique up to mutual congeniality or isomorphism of induced modules? No, the algebra of polynomials, I showed you one simple basis, but there's actually uh, as many, um, as many simple bases as there are elements in the field, uh, perhaps more. Okay, and uh, not only will those bases be discordant to one another, but also the modules that they will induce will be non-isomorphic. Okay, so whether you look at it this way or you look at it this way, the answer is no. Are there algebras such that any two simple bases are mutually congenial? Yes. We call those uh, uh, algebras with a, with a single uh, simple basis. It's only one because they are all mutually congenial. In our case, mutual congeniality is the same thing as equality. And uh, that sounds like a good place to stop. So I thank you. And speaking about thinking, I should have listed my collaborators. The list of collaborators on this topic includes many of my graduate students and visitors and postdocs. And so it is getting harder uh, to, to thank them, but I found a quick way to do it. 
And here, is, so here they are. Rebin Muhammad, Asam Mosafarika, Fatma Ibrahim, Majid Saleh, Pinarai Dogdu. And that's only a partial list, but I told you I was trying to stay cool. So there is a, a movie out there called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It was not a big hit, but it's out of the Harry Potter universe. So trying to stay cool and hip with my students, uh, this is my latest attempt. Maybe maybe it's a little bit cooler than all bases are created equal, but some are more equal than others. So thank you very much. We thank you very much. It was a nice talk. It was, I think, a good present from the new year and from the beginning of the seminar. If there are some questions, please ask them. I see that in the chat already there is something uh, where um, Harry Potter appears. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for that comment, Yanis. Yanis says that mathematics sometimes feels like magic, so the Harry Potter analogy is appreciated. Um, and um, uh, Florin asks if there are any applications for this. Uh, once again, you know, um, uh, Sometimes I tell people, you know, this whole idea of having a, a quasi basis uh, or a pseudo basis was the expression I was using. I used to call it a, a surrogate basis because this is someone who is not really the basis, but it can step in and you can pretend that it is the basis just because a real basis is, is too hard to handle. And so here you have this other one that is more user friendly and maybe you can use for, for computations. And it was making me think that if you think about it, uh, in the real world, using computers and stuff like that, we don't use the real numbers. We always use rational approximations to real numbers because you have a finite number of decimal places that you can deal with. It's maybe very large with a large computer, but it's still finite. So we're always using the rationals and uh, and making decisions about the real world with real numbers. So in a way, this is something similar where you can say, I'm going to do calculations on this bigger space uh, using the resources of a, an admittedly smaller space, but a space where I can work. Once again, if I was trying to find a, a real, uh, honest to goodness basis for the, the power series, uh, I don't know one, okay? Just like I don't know a basis for, for the reals over the rationals. These are things that in, in theory we know about them and we discuss them, but when you're trying to do calculations, sometimes you have to settle for the surrogate basis. So I, I don't have any applications, but I think the spirit of it uh, might have a, a, an application um, inspired um, uh, background. Thank you very much. One of my professors many years thought that um, we are going to apply your, your results. The answer was in my next promotion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And once so, again, as I was telling you, when, when we started with a vector space and then we added an algebra structure on it, just that it was something that allowed us to differentiate the basis. So the bases are no longer are no longer so equal. They're simple ones, they are um, projective ones. There's a new uh, classification of bases. They are not equal. They, they live differently in this place because it has an algebra structure. Now, the algebra structure that I added to it 
was just one that allowed me to multiply things together. It's not necessarily that this will be uh, an associative multiplication. I mean, so so what we were doing with uh, El Hamdari uh, a few months ago was looking for amenable bases over over quandals or quandal algebras. Be there, the multiplication is not associative, but but the questions uh, are the same. The notions are the same. Life is a little bit more difficult. When we started looking at this, our first attempt was with Levitt path algebras. This was about 10 years ago and Levitt path algebras were so, so popular. And we said, oh, this is our opportunity to, to contribute something in that, in that arena. Uh, but then things just get so difficult so quickly that we had to take a step back, a step back, step back. And finally we got to polynomials. And now we spend a lot of our time with polynomials with one variable, sometimes with more than one variable, but uh, uh, they are commutative, you know, for a non-commutative guy as myself, uh, polynomials are commutative, but it is that the, the work here can be complicated enough without us um, uh, making our life any harder. But if you want to make your life harder, uh, remove the uh, remove the associativity. Louis asks, if you put on a topology the, so that you can take infinite sums, uh, yeah, well, that that is just a, um, a different uh, question altogether. I mean, uh, but, you know, here when you're asking the, the, the rows to be finite, uh, you, that's one requirement on your matrices so that, so that the products make sense. So if you were willing to have a topology on the on the on the underlying field, then you could make your the condition on your matrices that the matrices are such that um, after multiplication uh, the products converge and. Uh, I am not sure. Maybe some kind of norm condition on the on the rows, instead of asking for the rows to be finite, to ask maybe the uh, the 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 sums of the rows to be convergent, something like that. It's definitely something that could be done. I was mentioning that after our proof that those maps are on to, uh, I kept feeling a little bit uneasy, like, are we waving our hands? And then we came up with a formal proof uh, that this works. And there we are using some topological arguments, but the topology is not, uh, the topology starts just with the, uh, with the discrete topology on the field, and we just allow it to grow because you're taking products and, and sums and the like. So that's where the box topologies and, uh, and other things uh, pop up and, uh, and explain why, why, why things work. But yeah, the uh, possibility of having some additional topology there and, and changing uh, uh, things to make them spicier is um, is definitely a, a possibility. Once again, right now, for for me, I would like to know what happens with other algebras. You know, we have spent a lot of time on polynomials. We have moved to to Taylor polynomials. We are moving to rational functions. We're looking at Levitt path algebras still with uh, the original. Uh, team, we have something we call graph magma algebras, and we spend a lot of time with those because they are very malleable to produce uh, counter examples. So I I am excited about this topic. You can play with it at different levels. You can do it in general, or you can pick your favorite algebra, whatever that may be, and say, oh, I wonder what that means in this context.
Okay, some other questions. I cannot see any questions. Okay, just thank you once again. I personally, oh, okay. Somebody has hands. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you for holding such a nice seminar. I've enjoyed stopping by now and then when the schedule allows it. And uh, I enjoy seeing uh, each and every one of you today. So, so thank you for this opportunity.